Omar Doom is my guest today, and you've seen him in a bunch of the Tarantino films, my favorite being Inglorious Bastards, where, spoiler alert, him and Eli Roth kill Hitler. Very cool scene. Uh, besides acting, he also does uh, writing for movies, and he wants to do it all with writing, directing, and scoring the movies, like John Carpenter, director of Halloween. And uh, he has a lot of background in music, actually. He plays piano, violin, drums, guitar. He sings, and he makes electronic music under the name Straight Razor. He's got new music out right now. The latest one is called Volume 2. Volume 1 is also available. And this music is like electronic, but it's industrial. And uh, great music for a soundtrack. He's already had one song placed with a horror movie. And we're going to talk about all this right now. Don't go anywhere. Let's do it. Omar Doom. This is exciting. I'm jealous of a lot of things that you've done, but one of the first things I got to bring up your first concert, Guns N' Roses and Aerosmith. Tell me about that. Yes. Okay. That was about 87, 88 ish. So I'm about 11 or 12 years old. And uh, I was a Guns N' Roses freak uh, when Appetite Destruction for Destruction came out. You know, I had posters on my wall um axel rose was like my hero um and uh they were coming to play at the spectrum in philadelphia and i lived about an hour from there uh eastern pennsylvania near allentown and uh they were opening up for aerosmith and so i begged my dad to take us there me and my one friend and uh he did it um, and we got there. I remember we were like two songs too late or one song. Were, we got there in the first song. They were playing It's So Easy. And I heard it in the parking lot. And I started running. Everyone was <laughs> running to the, to the gates. Everyone was just like swarming like ants. All the people that were a little bit late. Oh, my God. I got in there. We were sitting like probably on the side up a little bit. And, uh, you know, it was a very vulgar show. <laughs> I remember my dad just going like this. What? <laughs> like, so disgusted. He loved Aerosmith, though. That's cool that he would let you uh, to go to it. Because he's like, isn't your dad like a doctor? And I don't know. I just hear things of Indian uh, families are more strict about things like that. Or I guess maybe not. Yeah, well, my family was a little different. My parents were very involved in the arts, music. Uh, you know, they went to they were opera members um and they always pushed the arts on me taking me to plays and stuff and uh and they knew how mu how important music was to me because that's what i was playing all the time i had a band and everything already by this by this point and uh i mean i guess i gotta hand it to them i mean you're right uh it, it is a it's surprising that they would have taken me to that yeah i just do you ever have you are you familiar with goat face uh, comedy, the comedy uh, troupe or whatever. Um, no, I've seen their name. Um, yeah, it's like they had a spe like the guy from uh, the Daily Show. Uh, has, what's his name? Hassan Minaj or whatever. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, it's like him and then this comedian that I followed from Seattle, Fahim Anwar. And so they always like do it. That, like I didn't learn. I learned a lot about Middle Eastern culture from that from Goatface and like just like you know like how the Indian culture and Middle Eastern like how they raise their kids and like you know it's very strict about. It seems like they want their kids to be doctors and and things like that. So I th I think that stuff's kind of interesting uh, to to learn about the different cultures. So yeah, I I heard that your family didn't they take you to like it was like once a week they would take you to some sort of artistic kind of thing. It wasn't once a week, but just in response to what you just said about parents wanting their kids to be doctors, that is definitely yeah. what my parents wanted for me originally. Oh, really? Okay. Even though they would take you to see music, like this is a hobby, you're going to be a doctor. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was the, well, my dad mostly was like that. And I, I completely understand why he would come from that perspective. Um, you know, he wanted me to be able, he didn't want to have to worry about me financially. He wanted me to be able to live on my own and, uh, just, you know, I mean, he he came from, uh, you know, somewhere where we he had to study to work his way out of his, uh, you know, out of Kashmir um, and go to medical school and to get the opportunity to come to America. And, you know, and then you you want your the same for your son, you know, or your, ch your children. So I get it. 
but uh, it's, you know, I don't think they expected for me to become as American as I did, I guess. But I mean, they brought me up here. I don't know how they, you know, I could be surprised. But I, again, I get that too. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's interesting. Like that, that. So one of the com the comedians I follow from that go face for him, like his parents are like, you're going to be a, like, you have to get a doctorate or be a dentist. Um, the only thing that they would pay for was engineering. That was the lowest amount of school. So he's like, all right, I'll do engineering and then I'll do comedy on the side. And he's like, same thing as you. He's like, I get it. I get why they did that. He's like, I'm glad, you know, they understand why they didn't want to pay for a theater degree, but you know, now he's doing professional comedy and acting and all that stuff. So yeah. I think that I understand that. I understand that mentality. There's so many people think of many people who don't make it and they get these liberal arts degrees that, and then you're like, well, why did you spend all this money on school that, and then you're not even using it? Well, by 12th grade, I'd gotten my parents on my side. They, they saw how serious I was about what I was doing. I was making paintings a lot. You know, I was, I went to school for fine arts, Parsons for painting. And, uh, you know, they paid for that. And uh, I, ended up, I ended up being able to do a year in Paris at their campus and uh, study painting there. And so, yeah, I mean, again, I got to be grateful for that as well. That they, they did put me through an art college. That's really cool. I, I don't think I've seen your art. <laughs> What's huh? that? I, art? I, haven't seen, I haven't seen your art. Is it on your social media or your website? I don't know if I saw it. There's some art there. There's some art there. I'm going to be making some more art and probably have a, a show uh in the future oh okay that'd be cool who did the cover of your first album i the did volume one you did that one yeah that's fucking cool i love that one that was really cool with the skull and like how it's like i, I love that kind of shit my girlfriend <laughs> i think you're the same way like you love skulls my girlfriend's always giving me shit she's like you love skulls i'm like i do i mean how can i mean it's it's right here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it is what we are yeah. So, so Guns N' Roses, your first concert and then Metallica second. And then, so you're listening to Slayer and stuff. Then you get into the punk thing and then you play punk drums. And, what's that? Punk came before metal. Well, punk came first. Yeah. Okay. So that's when you were playing drums and you played drums in a punk co cover band and then guitar and then singing. So you learned it all. Yes. Well, I started with piano. That's what kind of helped me with everything. Five oh, years of piano starting in second grade, classical piano. And uh, from there, you know, once you once you learn kind of how music works with piano, it, it's a, it's easier to pick up instruments. Okay, I self taught myself everything pretty much. Were you did you like piano or were you good at it? At the time, you know, I didn't like having to practice. Yeah. You know, I wanted to go out and ride my bike or skateboard or be with my friends. You know, um, so it was a struggle. <laughs> to get me to actually play. So the strange thing is I want to go back and do it again now. I, would, I want to study classical piano. <laughs> but, uh, and it's probably going to happen in the future. But uh, I just realized that recently that I was going to circle back on that. But yeah, so back then it was kind of hard, you know, for my parents. Um, I, and I, enjoy, I quit, you know, in a few years because I just was like, I want to play guitar. I want to play drums. You know, I want to play rock and roll. So it was, I was kind of rebelling, I guess. Yeah, no, I was yeah, playing I was, violin. Sorry, I was playing violin, violin as well, and so I would turn it down and just play it like a guitar. <laughs> oh, so what? How old did it, or how long did it take before your parents would let you play drums and guitar and all that other stuff? Oh, they let me throughout the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was first. I was banging on things in my my room. I created like a cardboard drum set, and uh, they didn't pay for that though. I had to work to uh, buy myself a drum set by mowing lawns, and I had a paper route. <laughs> oh nice yeah that's like that's what most kids had to do like that or babysitting that was another thing that was more for for girls i guess i started my sis my older sister had it she's three years older than me she had a paper route and i was too young to have a paper route i think i was nine or something or ten so i had to use her name and then, <laughs> and then deliver so i could make money to uh buy a drum set okay wow that's cool <laughs> so then you get into the like the industrial music which I kind of wonder like what happened? Why I always thought that was going to be the future, like nine inch nails and ministry and uh throw kill cult and the uh, uh, front two forty two, all those, uh, that kind of stuff. And that's kind of what led you to the music that you're, that you're in now. 
Yeah, pretty much. But also I was, I hung out a lot in the club world. Like I love techno house, you know? And uh, so I, I went out a lot and uh, just between dance music and metal and punk and, you know, all the and 60s rock. I love so much. Get some vinyl right here, far rear in the Raiders, you know? And uh, I'm kind of seeing if I can fuse everything in some way. But um, I want to keep Straight Razor as m pretty techno. And then uh, I'm probably going to use the Omar Doom name for a separate project. Oh, what's and what's that going to be? I don't know why I just released that information. But yes, I got it on the podcast. <laughs> the official release. I can cut me. that out if you want me to. No, that's fine. You got me talking. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I'm going to sing on all of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so is that's it going to be What's that? That's, That's all you'll say. Never know. Okay. No, I like, I like, see, I'm not a big fan of like EDM, but I think your stuff is more, I wouldn't call it EDM. It's not dance music. It's industrial. But I mean, I'm, I'm explain to me, like if I go to a concert and I'm listening to this, I'm people are not dancing, are they? Well, I play a lot of dance music at my shows too, because I have some faster stuff. I have remixes okay. as well, but you are correct. There are moments when people, aren't sure if they should dance or not. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I've experienced that is people most of the time are just looking at me. They're not, they're just facing me like it's a rock show. Mm -hmm. um, but once I get some more uh, faster tracks going, I can start to see them start moving more. Uh, my music already is kind of going back to my, to, to the, I started more techno and it's kind of going back more to that now. So it'll probably be a lot more dancing in the future too. Okay. Yeah. Cause I like when I'm listening to your stuff, I, I, I mean, I'm just totally picturing like I need visuals. Like obviously the song uh, lady midday is in the horror movie already, but the first song on the new album is it, is it called, was it called enemy? I thought yes. I wrote it down. Yeah. That one. I mean, that sounds legitimately like the opening for a horror movie. Like exactly. Like it's built for that. I feel like I'm trying to do that with all my songs. <laughs> But uh, that one just came out. I haven't even sent it to licensing people. or So people who are making horror movies don't really know about it yet. So that could happen. Okay. So yeah, how did, do you have somebody like an agent or somebody that does that? Or do you have to send all that stuff yourself? Or Oh, the whole business side of things. There are people that help. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause that, but that is like, that's so competitive. But at the same time, if you want to make any money off your music or get recognition. It's almost like you have to have placement in those TV and movies and commercials and things. Usually they find you. Really? You know, unless you're a musician that's making music specifically this and sending out to people all the time, like that's your job. But uh, with, with me, it's uh, they've hmm, for spree, the movie spree with Joe Carey. Mm hmm where my track actually plays for the whole the entirety. It's like a five minute song and I play in the main titles in the beginning. I was really surprised by that. With Spree, um, I, I had someone who could just sent it out to a lot of people and they got a response from one of them. And uh, that's pretty much how it happened. Okay. Yeah, because that just seems like, uh, I mean, I don't know. It, you have other things, obviously. You have the acting and the clothing and stuff. So music's not your mate. But I know for a lot of the musicians I interview, like they they they, they, they have a hard time making money off of making a living off of uh, making music. So it's like they have to get it in these placements, movies and TVs. Yeah. Games. Yeah, it definitely helps a lot. I mean, I when I had my clothing line, I was getting a lot of movie placement with that. that yeah. That was actually cool. Um, but, uh, with this, you know, everybody, I mean, everybody wants their song in a movie, you know, mm -hmm. just did a remix for a friend of mine named Corvad and, uh, it's on his unreal remixes album, but, you know, he's garnering a lot of fame right now because his song Tesla, it was in the Batman oh. and, and he has just shot up pretty fast because of that yeah. The song got a million point five, uh, views already yeah that seems to be a big way to do it or i mean i guess stuff can just go viral on tiktok and youtube and all the other stuff too but yeah that's also really competitive have you thought of um doing like collaborations with straight razor with like some of the rock and metal musicians like trent reznor rob zombie or al jorgensen from ministry 
Well, yeah, if you're talking about those people, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say no to any of those people. Yeah. But you haven't like reached out to them or whatever. I mean, you would be open to it. I would definitely be open to it, uh, especially since, I mean, Trent and I are both scoring as well, you know. But, you know, he has his own thing going with Atticus and, you know, um, I haven't really reached out to anyone for, for, for collaborating yet. I do have um, a remix album in the, in the works right now of, of my songs from volume two. Uh, okay. But um, I haven't collaborated yet. I've talked about it with a couple of people. Okay. It might happen. So, some of the people that are on the remix album. Okay. Yeah. Cause I just think that I, that would be an interesting meld. See, like I said, I thought that was going to be nine inch nails and stuff. I thought that was going to be the future of rock. And then it seemed like it kind of died off. And then now you've got more like the, uh, I don't know, like kind of like the shine downs and, and those kinds of band is kind of like, I feel like rock just kind of stopped like evolving in like the early two thousands. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, people changed, you know? Um, but I feel like the, this whole scene that you're, you're talking about this industrial kind of techno scene, it's always been kind of a sub genre. It's always been, you know, a kind of a niche, uh, genre anyway. Um, People, there were times where people were like, oh, it's going to hit big this year, it's going to hit big this year, and, and, you know, it just didn't. But, um, I mean, I don't really think about that, because I don't really find myself in that genre really too much, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of hard to define where I am, but um, I'm probably more towards the techno side. Yeah, I know, and it sounds like if you have some other songs that are more uh dance oriented i feel like this this stuff that i listened to there wasn't a lot of dance there was parts where it kind of got lighter and i was like no 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 go back to the darker because i liked when it was dark and like kind of i was like oh this is cool i feel like i i don't know like is this bad to say i almost want to like eat have like an edible or something and just like i want some visuals and i just want to like really take it in yeah i mean i love making visuals for my for my music i mean i've been making lots of promo videos where I use uh, movies, Jalo films, which are horror movies from the 60s, 70s, European mostly. They're slasher films. It's actually where American slashers came from. And, uh, and one of the tropes in those films is you have a black glove killer with maybe, and the, and the weapon of choice for a lot of them was a straight razor. And so that's where my, the name straight razor comes from. And uh, I've been using a lot of those images in my promotional materials. Yeah, I saw some of your stuff on like TikTok. It was cool. You had the video with the uh, the cats in the cemetery for the uh, how do, that's from the first album. Uh, is it how do I say that name? I I Iblis. Iblis. Yeah. So yeah, that cat lives at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Really? Yes. I've gone there and hung out with it numerous times. We follow each other on Instagram. We're kind. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is a, that's a cool cemetery. That's from, I didn't know it was from the Hollywood forever cemetery. That's a really fascinating place. I mean, there's so many famous people there. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to be there. I mean, I wouldn't love to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Not now, like maybe in 60 years or something. Right. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you also said you wanted to conduct like an orchestra of your songs that, that would be interesting to hear that too. I was pretentious enough to say that. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> that would be great just because I'm always like, you know, with my bands, like I was teaching everyone how to play their instruments and like their songs. And uh, I kind of fell into that role really fast as a young kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, and even on stage, I was making sure everyone was playing everything. Right. And um, so that it just feels like a, something that would be fun to do. You know, having said that, I'm not sure what a conductor does. <laughs> i feel like they just go like this the whole time i feel like it's really easy like i could do it probably yeah yeah i don't know i have i have musical uh teacher friends that are probably gonna hate me for saying that because yeah but no i think there's probably more to it. it's like speed tempo and i'm sure there's a lot of things yeah. to the science of it but uh okay well yeah so we got to talk we got to talk movies and acting you're still acting right you still you're, you're writing some movies i hear i have movies already a couple of horror movies i did write um co-starred him with my old friend Michael Bacall who was in uh, some of those movies with me Death Proof and Glorious Bastards he's also a writer and um, they're horror movies horror comedies and I have uh, new ideas that I want to tackle what I really want to do is kind of combine all these things that I'm doing into a movie where I write 
direct score, you know, just a la John, John Carpenter, mm. you know, yeah. one of my heroes. So I kind of want to, that's, that's the, that's where I want to be. That's one of my goals. No, that's, that's really cool. That's a, uh, oh, wow. That would be, so do you like, obviously your friends or you were, you're, maybe not as close now, but with Quentin Tarantino, do you run some of this st stuff through him? Like some of these ideas, does he give you advice? He gave me advice in the beginning when I was writing. Um, you know, he was, he was, he was basically the first time I told him, he was like, tell your story and tell it well. <laughs> that was his first advice to me. Easier but, said than done though. <laughs> but when he said, well, I mean, he really was like, well, like, cause he's a natural storyteller, you know, just the whole right. art of storytelling is the fun part for him. So. Well, his, I think the thing with Tarantino that I love, I mean, obviously he builds so well the tension to the, there's always like that violent scene that's, you know, it's coming and that's what I love, but also his dialogue is so, I mean, that's, he's got to have the best dialogue of any screenwriter ever. You got to read uh, death proof. You get to read, you get this script. I mean, what are you thinking when you're, when you're reading this dialogue that, it, well, in all his movies, really, but especially that one, because that was the first one. He's just a masterful writer. Um, when I first got Death Proof, I wasn't, there was no talk of me being in it or anything. So I just got a hold of it. He sent it to someone that I know. He didn't even send it to me. He sent it to someone I know. I got but a isn't hold the character of named Omar? Kind of. So I get a hold of the script. I start reading it and just loving it. He had like a color cover on it. And um, at that time, Mickey Rourke was supposed to play the main character. And so his name was right. on the um, But uh, when I started reading that, I mean, when I saw my name in there and it says Omar, I was, I, was, I flipped out because we all know that he sometimes name some of his characters or people in his life or, you know, everything means something in his movies, you know, it comes from somewhere. And so I was like, oh my God, he named something after me. And I just thought to myself, oh my God, this can't just be him naming after me. I have to be in this movie, you know? And so I hit up someone that works with him named Jules. And I was like, oh my God, you gotta tell him that I'm going to read for this role. And I will knock it out of the park. I promise it's going to be great. She said that to him. She comes back to me and she's like, I said it to him verbatim. I said everything you said. We just have to see what happens, right? I get a call. I get, he said I'm allowed to, not him, he didn't call me. Someone called me and said that I could read for it, but I could send in a tape because I was in New York City, right? And uh, so, I mean, I broke all the rules, first of all, of making an audition tape. I you know, there was like a, I set up a bar scene in the background. There was like a title menu with music behind it and, uh, you know, like a soundtrack. And it was, you know, if you send this to anyone else, they're just going to laugh, you know? <laughs> but I thought, you know, he's a very unconventional guy. You know, he does things the way he wants to do them, no matter what. There's no rules with Quentin Tarantino, you know what I mean? So I thought, you know, I could take a chance on that. And uh, it turned out he did like it. Well, and he, cause he is a fan of you already. Like you guys have this friendship and he said, I mean, this has got to be the be best compliment coming from anyone ever that he said that you're cool and you are a super cool guy. Like he, Quentin Tarantino thinks you're cool. So you're already kind of in, right? That's true. He said I was legitimately cool. <laughs> that is fucking yeah. amazing. It's, it's not a bad stamp to have on your, uh, your resume. Is that like when, when you met him, I mean, you kind of had to play it cool, right? I mean, you can't fanboy out over Quentin Tarantino. Is that why he respected you or thought you were so cool? Or were you just not even a fan? Is that why he... Uh, I was definitely a fan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he almost wrote me off when I first met him because I thought I was too fan, too much of a fan. But um, uh, I kind of see two, two people. It's like when I'm with him, there's that guy who's my friend, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's the guy that there's Tarantino, the guy that makes movies, you know, there's Quentin and there's Tarantino. I kind of have them separated a little bit. Really? See, cause I think 
you guys like watch you had this is like my dream by the way this is like on my bucket list you had like movie nights with quentin tarantino like that is amazing to me because i feel like you can't really separate it like even though he's a director and he's directing even him, he's a fan first he worked at a video store he's a huge movie fan so like just watching a movie with him would be so cool because he's probably showing you movies that are like these like cool like cult indie movies and probably has really cool like takes on them and such yeah um he definitely introduced me to a lot of cool movies and in terms of your question about watching movies with him it is a lot of fun because he's having a lot of fun you know and his energy is contagious. His, you know, his love for cinema is, uh, you know, we all know how big that is. Yeah. You guys watched this movie. Uh, I don't think I've even heard of this movie, Pat Garrett and Billy, the kid. And he would say that you look like Bob Dylan in that movie. You reminded me of him a little bit. And so when the, tra see, so the trailer for that is, is something that we've watched a lot together and you'll see, you can see it at the new Bev, his theater. Hmm. There, where he plays uh, trailers and movies as well. Um, but we would always watch that trailer and there would be a part where it says, you know, starring Bob Dylan and they would show a, a shot of him and he would look at me and go, Omar Dylan. And uh, obviously, you know, I saw like sparkles when he, whenever he would do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Right? What is happening? Yeah. No. But I mean, it was, it was such a... Uh, endearing thing um of him to do it was really nice and uh he did it multiple times it was great this is like 20 years ago though okay yeah so you know i haven't hung out with him like that in a long time yeah so does he feel he thinks death proof is his worst movie though because i i think that's one of his best i mean i don't i wouldn't say it's the best but i really like that one is it just because it's kind of campy and stuff or uh i don't know if he said it's his worst movie maybe out of all of them mm -hmm. he places it at the bottom <laughs> worst is a strong word yeah <laughs> but even the worst quentin tarantino movie is like better than 99.999 percent of all movies so yeah just because you yeah. have to you know run everything from one to nine doesn't mean nine is bad right no totally well and i think it. I think in Glorious Bastards, I mean that's almost like a tie for like the, the best and like that one in Pulp Fiction. Those I feel like in Glorious Bastards almost I feel like it's almost better in a way because I haven't seen it as much as Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction's a little bit, you know, I've seen it so many times where I haven't seen in Glorious Bastards as many, but I rewatched it a few months ago. God, that's just such a great film. So explain the process. Like he brings you guys together for that movie and he makes you watch Nazi propaganda films to kind of get you in the mood for this like role? Yeah, well, first all the bastards, the eight bastards got into town in Berlin and um, we're all meeting each other. And he wanted to, you know, just remind us of, you know, the, the, the seriousness of the horrors, you know, that occurred of, of why we were there, you know, what we were fighting for. And uh, he showed us propaganda videos where, you know, the Germans were talking about Jews in the worst ways possible and like you know where they were teaching people how bad they were you know and uh it was horrifying to watch you know and it was heartbreaking to watch and uh so it, you know the room was silent when we were watching this it was a very small room actually he put us in and it was projected with a projector actually and uh you know it I guess he wanted us to make sure that we knew that we're not really there. I mean, we're there to, to work. But we're not really there to have fun. You know what I mean? And this is a really serious topic that we're working with. It's just a reminder. Hmm. But so the scene with, uh, where you're saying your names and, uh, Explain because that what kind of was a fun way scene in a way because we're didn't you weren't you guys brought in just to uh, be off camera for Kristoff and then you're all joking around and then Quentin's like all right I'm gonna relight this we're gonna we're gonna shoot this and then that was the scene that made it no uh, you're, I think you're thinking about something that happened in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood but uh, that that was written I think yeah. Oh okay maybe yeah I, I thought I saw I heard Eli Roth talking about it. I thought he was talking about. I thought he was talking about that scene. Maybe I'm maybe I'm mi mixing it up. There was stuff that was off the cuff. You're right. I mean, okay. Like I want you to say. Sometimes when he's directing, he starts throwing in lines, 
you know, into the script as he's directing. So we weren't ad-libbing that. Mm-hmm. It may not have been in the, what Eli is saying is it wasn't originally supposed to be there. Yeah, it wasn't. Oh, okay. But, but we didn't make anything up. Quentin told us what to do. He was just making things up on the spot a little bit. Oh, okay. No, that is, okay, that's interesting. So he just thought of it like right there. Yeah, where you guys sometimes look, like, he'll add things when he's, you know, direct. So the thing where you guys are like enunciating your names, yeah, that was on the spot? He was like, you know, he was just telling us what to do. I mean, we barely had a script then because he had just changed it all, you know, over Christmas. So it was, oh. you know, it was pretty loose. I mean, he had everything he wanted to do, but it wasn't really mapped out like the rest of the script was. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Like, I'm just so like jealous. You got the, like, not only Quentin, but also Brad Pitt and Eli Roth. Are you a fan of his? Cause I'm a huge fan of, of his directing obviously oh. too, but he's a great actor as well. Yeah. Okay. Check this out. When I was in New York once and, uh, went to opening night of hostel with Quentin. Okay. And the, the, the audience was, it was first of all sold out, you know, it was a huge crowd. We were right in the middle towards the front. And it was an experience watching this movie for the first time with this huge audience. People were just like closing their eyes. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was, I was, you know, I loved it. I was instantly a fan of Eli Ross. Now. Yeah, me too. I, the first time. I, yeah. Did you know what it was about? Cause one of the first time I saw it, it was just a buddy threw it on, on like the DVD player. And I was like, what is this movie about? And like the opening where you're seeing the guy, you're thinking it's like a serial killer. And then when the, the plot is actually revealed, it's just like, you're, it's just like jaw dropping, like so brilliant. Yeah. I love the flow of it, the pace of it, you know, of going on vacation and then, you know, ah, oh, what a great movie. It's based on a kind of based on some true story, sort of like there might be some things like that over in Europe. I mean, I, I'm going to have to assume I'm sure there's things like that here. Ah, that's crazy shit. Yeah, that's I think that's what makes it so those that the, makes a good horror movie is like it could be real, like the, just a the exactly. possibility. Exactly. Yeah. That makes things so much scarier. Yeah. Is that like the horror movies that you're writing? Is it similar to that? The ones that I wrote are are a little different than that. Um, they're more they're more comedies, but oh, really? uh, they're horror. But they're, they're, there's a lot of comedy in them. Well, so besides uh, the Tarantino movies that you did, you also I haven't seen this one, but you played you played Stanley Kubrick in the movie The Maestro. Is that right? Yes, that was a cameo. I mean, uh, it was a very brief. Uh, I'm just there for a little bit. Yeah. But that uh, seems like an odd casting job because you look nothing like Stan. Stanley Kubrick is like a large. Unless it was like a young Stanley, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it was a very young Stanley. Kubrick. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say because when I think of Stanley Kubrick, I think of the older, like, fat, bald, bearded guy, and I'm just like, this is an interesting casting job. So <laughs> that was more like a, a cameo. Did you also act in the the? Tell me about this working with Noel Gallagher from Oasis. You were you were in his music videos. I was. I was in a couple of them. I think. Yeah. Um, that was a lot of fun. He's he's a cool guy. You know, I didn't get to hang out with him too much, but, uh, that was a, that was, those are directed by a friend of mine, mine named Mike Bruce. He's the one who recruited me for those. And he directed both of them actually that I was in. One of them is starring Zoe Bell as a boxer. I think that's called dream on. Mm. And, uh, I'm, he put me in the audience as one of the guys that gets blood on him from the boxing punches because it was like a playoff of raging bull you know okay and so death proof was uh boxing so uh and then from there i got like a more of a bigger role in another no gallagher song which i forgot the name (laughs) yeah um yeah that was a lot of fun that one was like a roller derby one Hmm. there was i mean music videos i don't i i tend not to do them anymore because I did a bunch of them really quickly. Uh, I mean, I'll still do like, you know, I'm not against it, but uh, not something I've done in a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. Well, it sounds like you got a lot of cool stuff in the works. The new album is out right now. Straight razor volume two. 
volume one and two are both uh, available on Spotify. People can listen to it. Um, and then you're doing, you're kind of in the middle of a mini tour. Are you still touring? The mini tour just ended. I have okay. a show at in Los Angeles next Friday, July 8th at Das Bunker, which is at Catch One. Um, you'll be able to get a pre-release of this vinyl. This is Straight Razors Volumes 1 and 2 coming out on vinyl soon, but you can buy it at the show from me. Okay. Do you have other merch too, like t-shirts and all that? Yeah, t-shirts, patches, stickers. It's all going to be available. Okay. And then when are the your movies that you've written and uh, the ones that you're going to direct and all that, when are those be we'll see the light of day do you have the release dates on that or <laughs> no no you'll be the first to know okay awesome we well, have to come back and we'll talk about the, those and we'll pro- promote the movies as well yeah. and also your uh, omar doom solo yeah yeah okay everything cool. at omardoom.com all right perfect and then i always end with a charity um i think your publicist said stand up to cancer is the the one that you wanted to if people have a few extra bucks after they yeah. buy your uh, vinyl they can uh, donate it to stand up to cancer mm-hmm. okay is there a, a reason that you chose that one yeah well first of all for everyone around the world who has cancer and is suffering and in addition to that a couple of close people that i know that uh succumb to the disease Ugh. Yeah. My dad had uh, prostate cancer, luckily beat it. So, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that are not, there's so many forms of cancer now. It's just like, yeah, yeah if we can do some research and uh, that's a, definitely a good charity to donate to for sure. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this and letting me fanboy out for a little bit. It's uh, It's been a pleasure. Yeah. A lot of fun, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Omar. I'll see you later. My thanks again to Omar Doom. So cool to chat with. I love that he acts, writes, does music, art, clothing line, uh, just a multi-talented guy. Very cool to chat with someone like that. I'll have to have him back on the show. So much more to discuss, and I look forward to his upcoming films. I'm sure they're going to be great. But in the meantime, check out his music. It's available now. It's, again, dark and industrial stuff. And I think you got to sit back and listen, maybe with some visuals or something. It's great stuff, though. And make sure to follow him on social media or check out his website for more information. And uh, you can do the same for me if you like. I always appreciate all your support. Have a great day and shoot for the moon. Mm -hmm.